Last week, we concluded our study of chapter one. Chapter one ends with the admonition to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And, and at the, as the chapter comes to a close, we are given three examples of ways to be doers of the word. The first is to be self-controlled with our tongues. The second is that we would be self-sacrificial toward and care for the needy around us. And third, that we would be separate from the world, not that we would go crawl in a cave and not interact with the world, but that we would be in the world, but not of the world, that we would be different, that we would be set apart, we would be unlike the world, not just for the sake of the the way the world is, but from the evil ways of the world. So over the course of the, the rest of the book, James is going to pick up on these three themes And he's going to do so in three different chapters. Self-control of the tongue will be revisited in chapter 3. Separation from the world will be revisited in chapter 4. The care for the needy is picked up right here in chapter 2. And it speaks specifically to the sin of partiality. Showing favoritism toward some and neglecting others. And as we shall see, God shows no partiality whatsoever. Partiality is contrary to his heart, to his character, and his people should take no part in showing partiality or favoritism for any reason. And so I invite you now, if you're able, to stand with me as we just seek to honor the Lord by standing as we read his word together. We're going to be reading from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. My brothers... Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing comes also in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become become guilty of it all, of all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, for this, your word, and for all that you teach us in your word. Lord, we, we have seen over these last few weeks that your word functions in a few different ways. One of them is as a mirror, Lord, to reflect ourselves, our true selves, that we would see our sin. Lord, we, we don't enjoy seeing our sin, but Lord, we want to see our sin, that we might repent of it and turn from it. Lord, would you this morning, through your word, show us our sin that we might turn from it. Lord, would your word also in in showing us our sin and showing us your perfect righteousness does another thing, and that, that is that it guides us. It is It shows us how that we are to live, to honor you and to glorify you in our lives. And so, Lord, this morning as we Come to your word and consider this second purpose of your word. Lord, we pray that we would walk away understanding how you have called us to live as yours and why we ought to live this way, what we can know about you through your word. Lord, we again thank you for your word. Pray that it would do its work in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
And uh, James begins here in chapter 2, continuing to address the church with a command. A command. He says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. There is kind of a, a sandwich created here with the command in the middle. And the outside of that sandwich, the two pieces of bread, so to speak, on the outside of, of the command in the middle demonstrates the rationale, the reason, the basis for the command that lies in the middle. It says, remember who you are. You are brothers and sisters in Christ. You are the church. You are the family of God, the bride of Christ. Partiality is inconsistent with the family of God. It's as if to say, reminding us that this family behaves differently. Life in the family of God is absent of that partiality and favoritism. It goes on on the other side, saying, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Remember then who your faith is in. You hold faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Partiality is inconsistent with the people of God because it is inconsistent with the heart and character of God. Multiple places in Scripture are crystal clear on God's approach and view of partiality and favoritism. Tells us what he thinks about it. Galatians 2.6 says, God shows no partiality. Romans 2.11 says, for God shows no partiality. Ephesians 6, 9 says, there is no partiality with him. So I think we've got that under control here, right? God shows no partiality to one person over another. And he expects that we, his children, would be the same way. And so back to the command. The command is direct. The command doesn't beat around the bush. It says to us, show no partiality. But first, it gives us a picture of partiality, doesn't it? Now, we don't know exactly what's going on in the church to which he is, is writing. We, we know that James is writing to his church of Jerusalem that's been scattered due to persecution. And so there are places, Christians scattered in lots of places. His church members have been scattered out throughout the region. It could be that this very situation is occurring in some of the places where his people his church members are living. It may be that this is a, an illustration uh, that, that points out that the favoritism and, and partiality is to be avoided. But just so that nobody can, under, can say that I didn't understand what you meant by saying show no partiality, he gives them a picture. He gives them a picture. And so here's the example in a nutshell. He, uh, a man walks into the assembly, and the assembly is the gathering of the local church, and he's wearing fancy jewelry, and he's got fine clothing on, and he is followed a few minutes later by a man who is not, a man whose clothes are tattered and are shabby. And with the first man, the man who's dressed up all neat and got his nice clothes on and got a gold ring on his finger, well, they dote over him. The, crowd, the, the people there at the church, they, they treat him with great respect and honor, and they show him to a special seat up front, probably near to the important people. But to the second man, the people send him away to stand by himself. Now, the situation may look painfully familiar to you. We don't have a hard time imagining such a situation existing, that people would treat others in such a way that people would treat others differently based on their appearance or status. You know, if you've been through middle school, you've probably experienced such behavior. But the thing is, middle school kids do a lot of things that we hope that they grow out of. <laughs> uh, and by God's grace, they do. But the situation here is not describing the self-centeredness of middle school students. The situation here is the church. It's the church. Maybe it's helpful for us to put it in contemporary terms. It's a Sunday morning here at the church, and it's a few minutes before service starts, so people are kind of making their way into the building. And there are a few people that come in that you haven't seen here at the church before. And the first one, he looks familiar. I know I've seen him somewhere. Where have I seen him? I've seen him on TV. I didn't recognize him before, but that's Aaron Sachs. I didn't recognize him because he wasn't standing next to Travis Kelsey. 
And he's all dressed up and has his nice clothes on. He's got his family with him. And boy, he's shown up front and he gets to sit down near the pastor and gets an introduction to the pastor. And you hear people saying, boy, but his offering would be nice to have here at the church. It'd be nice to have his family, add a few more kids to our church. We'd, we could use a family like that. And then the second person comes in. Well, that second person looked familiar too. You hadn't seen him at church before, but he looks familiar. But you, you haven't seen him on TV. The place that you've realized that you've seen him before is at the corner of James River and Campbell. And he's holding up a cardboard sign. That's where you've seen him before. But he's left his shopping cart out in the parking lot and his dog tied to the shopping cart. But he's, he's come in and he's looking a little rough and he's smelling even rougher. And the response to this man is a bit different. At first, folks try ignoring him, thinking, well, maybe he won't stick around and he'll realize he, when he realizes he doesn't really fit here. And folks are suspicious, murmuring to one another, I wonder, I wonder what he wants. While Aaron Sachs and his family were promptly ushered to the good seats and introduced to the pastor, this man was only spoken to in order to encourage him to sit in the back so that it didn't make anybody uncomfortable and they didn't have to smell him. Two men, both new to the church but treated totally differently. This is the kind of situation which apparently was not all that unfamiliar to the people which James is writing to. And unfortunately, it may, may not be so unfamiliar in our day either. It's easy to be disgusted by such behavior, thinking, I, we would never do that. I would never do that. And to be fair, church, this is something I have never, ever seen at this church. Yeah, amen. I would be shocked, quite honestly, if I were to ever see it or hear of it. You have all shown yourselves to be incredibly kind and gracious and welcoming to, to every guest I've ever seen come through the door. But, but attitudes of partiality and of favoritism could still be lurking in our hearts. In the example that James gives us, a church is showing favoritism based on economic status, treating the wealthy exceptionally well while neglecting, even shunning, looking condes condescendingly on the poor. But in the language that's given here in the first verse of James chapter 2, James speaks to much more than showing favoritism regarding the wealth of an individual or neglecting them because they're poor. The word, word translated uh, partiality or favoritism literally means to receive according to the face. It means to make judgments based on external appearance. Maybe to use a modern phrase or a phrase that you've used to judge a book by its cover, looking on the outside and thinking you know what's on the inside. Such judgments might be related to economic status like James describes, but it could also include making judgments about someone based on the way they dress, whether they're well kept, the style of their hair, the color of their skin, or a host of any other such characteristics. As the people of God, such partiality and favoritism must never be present. We must guard against it because it is often subtle and goes unnoticed. It may be present and we don't even know it. To make such judgments is not in any way to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you may be thinking, Pastor, why are you spending so much time on this? Well, there are four particular reasons why I think it's important to consider the danger of partiality and favoritism. The first three are in our text this morning, and the fourth is more specific to us here at Brookline. And so let's look at the first now. Partiality is opposed to true religion, brothers and sisters. Partiality is opposed to true religion. We have seen over the last few verses what religion that is pure and undefiled before God is. That's the way chapter 1 ends. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. You see, it's to care 
for the needy. Partiality doesn't, doesn't lead one to care for the needy, but to neglect the needy, to shun the poor. Acceptable religion is inclined toward the needy. Real relationship with God moves you toward the needy, not away from them. Favoritism, partiality is profoundly unchristian. It says, in effect, that someone is worth more to the world, that someone who is worth more to the world is worth more to the church. And that correspondingly, someone who is worth less to the world is therefore worth less also to the church. Favoritism ends up judging one person's soul as being of greater value than another's. And it does all this on the basis of superficial, worldly criteria. As one commentator notes, favoritism of the sort that James has been describing is the opposite of not being polluted by the world. It is letting the world determine how much spiritual worth someone has based on their economic standing or any other such measure. Such a mindset can slip its way into the Christian's thinking quite easily. How many times have you or I said or heard someone say something along the lines of, you know, they'd be a great addition to our church. As if there is a person out there that we wouldn't say is a great addition to our church, right? We don't want people to to come to our church for what they can give to our church. We want people to come to our church so that they can join the family of God, hear the gospel, and proclaim the gospel to others, and we can help them grow in their walk with the Lord. Christians and churches need to give great care not to think of a wealthy unbeliever as being more important or more worthy of ministry than a poor unbeliever or to celebrate more over some celebrity coming to church than over a homeless person coming to church. So partiality opposed is opposed to true religion. And secondly, partiality opposes the gospel. Verse 5 says, Listen, my brothers, Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? Partiality goes against the grain of how God works. James encourages his readers to look around, to look and see. God delights in choosing the poor of the world to be rich in faith. At the time of James, Early in the first century, the church was overwhelmingly filled with those who were of poorer backgrounds. The 12 disciples did not come from prominent families or dignified vocations or influential positions. They were ordinary people. Ordinary people. Likewise, the early church was filled with ordinary folks from poorer backgrounds. James reminds the church, God is calling many who are poor, and he's doing the same today. Paul would say something similar in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Neither Paul nor James is saying that God doesn't save those who may have wealth, those who are influential in society. He does save those people. He did in the old th- he did in he did in Jesus time. He did Nicodemus. He did in John 3, and he does so today as well. But Jesus does tell us that wealth is often an obstacle to receiving the gospel. And James and Paul show us that God's pattern of bringing salvation to the lost often includes the low of society, the poor. So in a nutshell, God is glorified by saving and using people the world thinks are worthless. So the church ought not to shun and exclude them. We ought to look at people through God's eyes, not through the eyes of the world. So partiality, secondly, opposes the gospel. And thirdly, partiality violates the second great commandment. In Matthew 22, a man asked Jesus, Teacher, what is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the law and the prophets. Now one might imagine that the church to which 
that James is writing actually thinks that they're obeying that second commandment well. Because they believe themselves to be obedient. They believe that because they're, they're loving their wealthy neighbor well. They're treating them as they would treat themselves. The problem is that they're only loving some of their neighbors as themselves. Only loving the rich and the powerful. The ones more like them. The ones that are more comfortable to be around. The ones from whom they have something to gain. But selective obedience to the law, brothers and sisters, is disobedience to the law. And James writes that to keep the whole law but fail in one point makes one guilty of all of it. How do you become a lawbreaker? You don't have to violate every law. You just have to violate one. When you've broken a law, you have broken the law. The same lawgiver stands behind every commandment. And to fail to love our neighbors the way God commands is to break his law. You and I cannot be faithful to the second great commandment if we only apply it to certain people. Love your neighbor as yourself doesn't mean love those neighbors as yourself and not those neighbors as yourself. Favoritism breaks the law. Partiality, it breaks the law. When you only love some of your neighbors as yourself, you are not loving your neighbor as yourself. And so partiality is so important for us to consider because it is opposed to true religion. It is opposed to the gospel. It, it, it violates the second great commandment of loving our neighbor as ourselves. But finally, partiality is so important for us to consider this morning, and this is more specific to us right here at Brookline. It's because God has called this church to minister to its neighbors. That's not unique to us. But what is unique to us is that our neighbors are changing. Our neighbors are changing. Many of you have heard me say over the last couple of years that your address is no accident. Your address is no accident. That means that God didn't put you where you are on accident. Your physical address of your home, the place where your mail goes, is not an accident. God put you where you live to minister to the people around you. That begins with the people in your home, and then that expands to those around your, your neighborhood and your places of influence, where you, where you work, where you go to school, wherever you find yourself. But in the same way, brothers and sisters, the address of this church is no accident either. God providentially put us here, just as he put you at your home, to minister to those around you. And increasingly so, what is around us is going to be apartment complexes and multifamily housing. Just across James River here, James River Freeway, the Iron Grain District is going in. In addition to some restaurants and shopping, I'm really hoping for a coffee shop. In addition to the Roost, maybe a Mexican restaurant, that'd be good. Uh, but there's, there are 200 units, multifamily units, going in across there. They'll be there before too long. With MM expanding in the coming year, I would expect that we would see construction beginning very soon. And you go a little further down MM, and you imagine where the road change is going to happen. You turn, you turn left when you get past Amazon, and you drive on that imaginary MM over to 60, where David knows right where I'm talking about, right across the street from you, where the new apartments are being built out there just outside of the Republic, welcome, new Welcome to Republic sign. That place is called uh, Falls, uh, Stone Creek Falls. And at that place, there are going to be 1,396 units. That's a lot. <laughs> so again, the road set for construction down there in 25, here in 24. And so within two years, a three-minute drive is going to take you past 1,600 units. If two people on average live in each of those units, we're talking about the 15% of the current population of Republic living down the road just a few miles. If on average there are three people per residence, 
that means that 25% of the current population of Republic is going to be just down the road here a few miles. Within three minutes, we could get to that many people. God, in his providence, planted this church 141 years ago. And he brought this church out here 50 years ago. 23 years ago, he led the church to purchase eight more acres upon which we are sitting part of, on part of it to give us this current location. And this location, 141 years after the church was planted, brothers and sisters, is primed for ministry. We can get excited about that. We ought to get excited about that. God has uniquely placed us in a position to minister in the midst of this growth. I want to show you a map here. It's, probably, it's really hard to see, I'm sure. But that is a map of Greene County. It's a map that is posted in the Greene County Associational Office on the wall there, a nice pink wall. And then every little red flag that you can't see very well, those are all the churches. Okay, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit to FBC Brookline. It's outlined in pink. We got a blue line coming over, and then there's kind of a double pink circle. Do you see that? That's where our church is located. Look at where it is in relation to all the other churches that are there. Do you see any other flags close by? They're not real close, are they? Now, we... God has uniquely, and I believe strategically, placed us in a specific location for the ministry that he has for us. I want to show you another picture. Look inside that lovely red line that I drew. <laughs> there is only one flag. That's a big circle, but there's one flag. And it's this flag. It's us. Um, that's really hard to see. There's a yellow circle in there. And that's the, where the real growth in population growth is occurring. Brothers and sisters, you think God knows what he's doing? <laughs> think of the responsibility that's been put on us. Let's be obedient. God has given us immense opportunity. That whole big red circle has one flag in it. And the other thing is, guys, I don't think we're going to see a whole lot more flags in that area because the land is so darn expensive. You can't afford to buy land to build a church on out here. And so God's saying, First Baptist Brookline, you're it. You're plan A. And there is no plan B. His church is plan A. And so church, we have got to bloom where we're planted. God has planted us here and we must be faithful to prepare ourselves to reach the many that are going to be all around us. What will that look like? Well, we'll know more in the months and years ahead. But the odds are is that many who live around us won't exactly look like you or talk like you. They may not even speak your language. But we must determine now, brothers and sisters, to show no partiality. When someone comes into these doors looking different than you or smelling different than you or speaking different than you, even reeking of weed, or dressed in a way that you know doesn't align with the gender that God has given them at birth? That doesn't matter. These are some of the needy to which God has called us to love and reach with the good news of the gospel. These are our neighbors whom we've been commanded to love as ourselves. This does not mean that we approve of sinful lives or support sinful choices but that we value each person as an image bearer of God and see them as individuals who are either on a, one of two tracks, to heaven or to hell. Image bearers to which God has commanded us to go and to make disciples. 
Brothers and sisters, as the final verse of this passage teaches us, we all are deserving of judgment. We are all in need of mercy. And the good news of it all is that that mercy is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, when we were needy, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and we were actively shaking our fists at God in rebellion, Jesus came to earth to pay the penalty for our sins. Not because, he want, not because we wanted it or because we loved him, but because he loved us. And he lived a life that we could never live. And he died in our place, paying the penalty for our sin, paying a debt that we could never pay. Forgiveness of sin and eternal life belong to all who turn from their sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, we have a great mercy. We have received a great mercy. When we deserved hell and judgment, we receive forgiveness and eternal life as sons and daughters of God through repentance and faith. So brothers and sisters, in light of the mercy that we have received, let's be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving ourselves. Let's extend mercy to others for we have received an incomparable mercy from our Lord Jesus Christ. This week, uh, this week, I got to, to spend a few minutes visiting with Hosey Blue. Some of you uh, know Hosey, are familiar with him, retired pastor from uh, Ridgecrest. And he lives in Nixa and, and, and pastor of the church over there now. But we got to talk, and we got to talk about the changes that are coming our way here at our church. And let me just tell you, he's really excited for us. And he said, I pray for you guys every time I drive by that church, and I do it quite often. But he, was, he shared a story with me. And he said, he said, when I came to, to Springfield in the mid-80s, there was a church on the, on the east side of town, the other side of town, that was doing well, it was flourishing, things were good. But as the community around the church changed, the area became to be surrounded by lots and lots and lots of apartments. And for whatever reason, this church did not reach the hundreds of people who were filling the apartments that surrounded that church. And before long, the church was closing off parts of the building because they didn't need it. They weren't, didn't have enough people there to use it. They are going to save some money and not have the heat on over in that part of the building. How sad. How sad. Brothers and sisters, our community is now changing too. Our community is, is changing and it may get uncomfortable at times, and it may get challenging at times, but brothers and sisters, we weren't called to comfort and ease. We were called to die to ourselves and to make disciples for the glory of God. Five to 10 years from now, I don't wanna be shutting off parts of the building because we refuse to minister to those around us. So brothers and sisters, let's commit now to pray for future ministry in the neighborhoods that are even now just being built. Let's commit now not to dig in and protect what is comfortable and resist change, but to pursue the advancement of God's kingdom and embrace the ministry that he has given to us. And let's determine now that we will reject partiality and favoritism and instead pursue loving our neighbor as ourself and showing mercy and love, the love of Christ to all that we would come in contact with. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh God, you have laid out a, a great task before us. And it is terrifying. <laughs> but it's what you've called us to do. And you told us that you're, we're not going to be doing it by ourselves. When you gave your disciples a great commission and by extension, all of us, the great commission, you said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, he said, even to the end of the age. Lord, as the opportunities for ministry increase and change right here at our church. 
Lord, we want to heed the command of James to show no partiality. Lord, we there are there are but two categories: sinners and sinners saved by grace. And Lord, we have the good news of the gospel. Lord, help us to not judge by exteriors, not to see those things as the most important things, but help us to see souls, souls that need Jesus. Lord, in the changes that are coming in this area, Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray for discernment. We pray for grace and we pray for courage and boldness. God, you, you put us here for such a time as this. Lord, help us to rise to the challenge, to put our yes on the table. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let us be quick and ready to say, yes, Lord to what you have before us. Well, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.